or that in, through auto-suggestion, going into those states makes it much easier for me. Yeah, um, that's a very good point. I, I don't really use, out, you know, affirmations out loud. I use, uh, I, I do things like affirmations all the time. Um, but remember I was talking earlier about the, the left temporal parietal junction and the right temporal parietal junction and the, the inner dialogue versus the story of experience. And what these are both hubs in, in an area of the brain called a, a, a network of, of neurons in the brain called the default mode network, and they're in communication with one another. So when you change that inner dialogue and you say, I'm, you know, I'm an out, uh, I am an out of body experiencer. I can, I can do this. I can astral travel, whatever. Changing that um, inner dialogue changes the story of experience and the sort changing the story of experience changes the inner dialogue. So there's this feedback to communication. So doing affirmations definitely helps. And um, whether you're doing them out loud or whatever, um, I think they both help. And, and you may be right that, that hearing it out loud might be, might be helpful as well. Um, I remember one, um, uh, one time I was uh, driving home um, and I, I, for whatever reason, my, my brain started thinking about that kiss, stupid kiss song, right? There's a, a stupid kiss song, uh, I want to rock and roll all night and party every day. And I don't know where this came from, but I don't like kiss. I don't like their music. I never have. I never will. But I couldn't get the, the song off my brain. So what I did is I changed the lyrics and I changed it. So I, I, I was singing the song to myself in my head as my wife slept in the car next to me. I was singing to myself, I want to OBE all night and lucid dream every day kind of thing. And I just kept doing this, repeating that over and over and over. And that night I had an, uh, uh, an OBE. <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah, it, it helps to, uh, to, to program yourself as well. Um, so just even touching if you're on resistant to hypnosis like me, you know, I'm resistant to hypnosis. And even if you're resistant, um, that's kind of a form of it, changing your inner dialogue. It's still something that you can do to change your life. Yeah, I think I would be a bit resistant to the hypnosis because you have the sense of someone else controlling you. But I guess if you're doing it for yourself, it should hopefully be less fear because you're kind of guiding yourself through the process. Mm -hmm. Just lay, what Layla's other question is, when we, decide to vi when we decide to visit someone that we know in the astral, do they feel anything? Question mark. Is it also possible to meet someone um, that is dead. And I think, and Layla's um, messaged me uh, before about this, about kind of trying to visit friends during astral projection experiences and trying to, and I'm sure a lot of us have tried to do that before. To, to do that before. And it's an, it's an interesting area in terms of why it might succeed or not succeed. Um, so that's what, that's what she's asking is that when we decide to visit someone that we know and that, do they, and also do they, do, do you think that they feel that? Do you think they feel that intention or that, uh, you know, and, and that, that meeting in some way? And there are, I'm sure a lot of us who do these things have had many experiences where we've, you know, I, I have this a lot with my partner, I have an out of body experience and something, and because I'm often in this duplicate reality of our bedroom, there is a there is a response. Sometimes her energy body actually gets up and starts to talk to me, or wants to come on the journey with me, and we have that encounter. But often, in the next morning, when you say to your partner or your friend, you know, do you remember anything? We had we had a meeting last night. Then you know, often they say, I don't remember. But that might not that might not doesn't mean it's not happening on some level of of of, of reality. But there's, there's just a really yeah really nice sort of question about how how to how to connect. What would be your feelings it, about that, Bob? I think it has to do with um, how sensitive the person is. Um, if you are maybe, a, if you were a, a spirit medium or something like that, you might have a chance at, at uh, recognizing somebody that's out of body. Um, but if, if, if not, there's, there's probably little chance. Um, I remember one time um, I was living in, in a suburb of Minneapolis and uh, my wife and I, and she always stays up later than I do. I always go to bed earlier because I start work pretty early. And so one day I uh, went to bed early. I went to bed, I think maybe 10 p.m., something like that. I, I went, in, went into the bed and I found myself, I immediately induced an OBE pretty easily. And I kind of glided down the stairs because this was, she was downstairs watching TV and um, I was upstairs in the bedroom. So I, I glided down the stairs and I stood right in front of her and I'm like, 
Kathy, Kathy, can you see me? Can you see me? And she couldn't see me at all. And then eventually I lost hold of the um, experience and found myself back in bed. And I, I got up and I went down there and I said, well, did you see me? And she said, no way. We, you know, I said, I was standing right in front of you doing this, <laughs> you know, waving my arms. She had no clue. Um, you can, you can even pass your arms through somebody and they, they usually won't, uh, it won't affect them at all. Yeah. Um, yeah. And as far as, as contacting the dead, um, I've got an article again on my blog. Um, it's a very difficult thing to do because it, it, I've had encounters with people that have passed on, but not many. And there've been cases, um, well, in, in one particular case, um, my wife's best, best friend, Pam, died unexpectedly and she was in her 30s. She had a couple small kids. It was a very tragic uh, death. And her husband was standing right next to her. He was an, an EMT, so he was a trained medical professional and he couldn't save her. Her heart just exploded. Um, but anyway, she had died and, um, and everyone was all broken up or whatever. After that, I spent a full year, every out-of-body experience I had for that year, I tried to contact Pam and say, hey, Pam, you know, do you have any messages to give your, hus your husband or kids? Do you have any, anything you want to tell Kathy, whatever? I was never able to contact Pam. And I think the reason is not, not because I wasn't experienced at traveling, because I got, I've gotten pretty good at traveling to an intended location now, but because both parties have to agree on it. I think Pam was just never at a point where she wanted to talk about it. She left this world. She didn't want to face the, the sadness and, and the people she left behind. There's so many emotions and ties there. I think it would have just dragged her down and she didn't want that experience. Mm -hmm. um, I have uh, people who've, who've had encounters with the dad. I mean, it happens. It's happened to me. I've, I've done this a few times. But it, it, you need the cooperation of the dead person. Um, and, and, and that's not always an easy thing. A lot of people find it a very difficult thing. Part of the problem, too, is that your emotions that are involved here, your emotional attachment to that person is often enough to keep you from having the experience in the first place. So that you have to, when you induce an OBE, you have to abandon all of your thoughts and emotions and ego and everything else and get to that very, that point of stillness. And I think that when, you know, if your mind is on this other person or whatever um, that you're trying to contact, you'll never get to the out-of-body experience in the first place because your emotions and, and those feelings about that person, those, those ties, are going to keep you from the experience itself. Um, so anyway, it's a, it's a tough thing to, to, to accomplish. Do you have any feelings about, I always, I always find that, I always, there, there are, there are when, you, when you talk to people that are regularly having out-of-body experiences, there do, there do seem to be these familiar things, such as when, when, you, when, you, when you're having more and more of these experiences, it does seem that eventually you'll be given certain, as it were, kind of tasks, tasks to do or something like that. For example, in the past, having out-of-body experiences sometimes, and, and one experience that also touches on another thing, is that so within this out of body experience just to retell it I, I came out of my body i came to the window and i just thought because sometimes these experiences can be fairly short within lucid dreams out of body experiences there can be sometimes that ten tendency to have that sense of urgency you know i must i must do this i must fly to mars i must go and visit and these things have to happen which can lead to quite a, a, a sort of what's the word like a um, not an, an unpatient state of mind within within the state, wanting things to happen quite quickly. But I remember in this out of body experience, I just thought, no, I'm not going to have that that approach to this experience. I'm just going to relax. I'm just going to I'm just going to chill out, as it were. And I just started sitting on the on this on my window frame, the astral window frame, just relaxing, just enjoying the experience. And it, and maybe that was an important thing for me to be able to do that because then I flew down into this into the street environment. And I remember that this, these two kind of, uh, or at least one kind of guide being seemed to be um, walking with this woman towards me. And she said, you know, she said, you, you could talk to this woman. You, you've got things to help her. You should give, you know, you should talk to her about some of your practices. You can help this person. So it was as if maybe, I don't know who she was. Maybe she was a human being in the dream state or having some sort of experience. And she was brought to me because I could, I could start to offer, offer her 
some support or, or teachings and maybe the fact that I had just relaxed into the state meant that there was some response to that and thought okay he's ready to start to help people within these states or I've had other out-of-body experiences where other uh, projectors seem to be coming to help me seem they seem to be more like these to have a sense that they're like a someone that's human within that state coming to me for some reason to give me some guidance or support in terms of my you know evolution within that within that state so that's an interesting thing just in terms of how these things can begin to progress you can you can be, you know certain tasks can be given to you okay like if you, okay tom you know or, you know if you're going to have all these out-of-body experiences you know this is what you can begin to do with them you can you can help these other beings within these realms in terms of giving them support you know as a i remember being told within that out-of-body experience that that I was told that they thought that I should take some of my work to Russia. They said that Russia would benefit from some of your work. So that's an interesting one for me to explore doing. I should do some Facebook ads more dark targeted in Russia or something like that. I don't know. But yeah, that was an interesting one. But also there do, there do seem to be these kind of, as well, it's interesting that there are, there are these kind of perennial uh, kind of processes of, of initiation in some kind of way. Often like there have been out of body experiences where you know this kind of impersonal voice would just start asking me certain questions and it was as, as if depending on how i answered the questions another level of reality was opened up to me i'd answer the question again and another level of reality would be would would, op would open up to me and uh, i have read um most of bob's books and i would really recommend them and some of the things that he's talking about are mentioned in the most recent one i think the one um uh, leveraging science, hacking, hacking, hacking the, the out of body experience. Yeah, yeah, that's a really, really good book. Uh, leveraging, leveraging science to do that. It's a really good book. Recommend, recommend. That. I can't remember if if you're in your books, you talk about having these kind of. Uh, you may, you probably have had these OBEs that seem to have a very sort of, um, for for want of a better word, sort of test feeling to them, or sort of initiatory oh, yeah. type of feeling for them. Yeah, and. To me, it's more like um, my, my OBEs kind of evolved to a point where you're right, it, it almost seems like I'm being shown a lesson and or, or you know, being shown something. Um, a lot of times it, it feels like I'm being guided to, to do something or to be somewhere or whatever. And a lot of times it's just, you know, it's, it's a lesson. I, I, um, I, I wrote about some of these and I, I got a, a very, um, not very well known book, my second book called Lessons Out of the Body. And it has more to do with the spirituality of OBEs rather than inducing them and, and the, you know, what, what to expect and all of that. Um, and I talked about some of the things, some of the lessons like, like um, um, that I had encountered in my OBEs and some of the other things. But yeah, it's, it's a very, very um, good point is that a lot of times it, it seems like like um, the guides are surrounding you, and they're gonna then you're gonna give you some kind of lesson or something like that, or have some task to do. And a lot of times I'm questioning why or whatever, and you know, and of course they're the guides out there are usually um, tight lipped. They don't they don't want they don't want to talk to you very much. Um, <laughs> that's one one thing you mentioned though. I mean, it, it, it's a clear. I, I love that. Um, that you said that you were just you know kind of chilling at your your windowsill because yeah. I mean, that's kind of one difference for sure if you can tell you can tell a, a lucid dream from an out-of-body state is and a lucid dream is like a regular dream in that well you're conscious that's different but like a regular dream you seem to have a story that's going on and you're kind of getting pulled along this story and this happens and this happens and this happens like in a dream you're, you're constantly walking through this thing and, and boredom is not an option. In mm. an OBE, boredom is an option. You can sit there and fold your arms and say, well, <laughs> what am I gonna do this time, you know? And, and it's, it's, anyway, it's qualitatively very different. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I've had strange experiences where I remember one time um, I, I induced an OBE and I, I opened up my, my out of body, my non-physical eyes, and I saw what I thought was a spider on the ceiling, and I thought this is weird. And pretty soon, another spider, and another, and pretty soon the whole the whole ceiling was filled with spiders. And I knew it wasn't real spiders, but mm. it, was, it was kind of a lesson that I was being taught from my these non 
you know, non-physical guides or wh whoever it was, was trying to yeah. teach a lesson about uh, spiders and, and love and all of this stuff. And, you know, and, and I was just flooded with all of these, you know, you know, emotions and things like that. But a lot of it is just, you know, for our own, um, our own learning. Um, mm -hmm. One of the many benefits of OBEs is it can teach us so much about ourselves and open up so many doorways to, to you know, learning, spiritual learning. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and, and and definitely with guides and both lucid dreams and out of body experiences, they they do definitely seem to work on a need to know basis. They they don't necessarily tell you the answers if it's going to be more the overall evolution for you to find out the answers or for you to grow yourself. They do seem to work in that way, and we always need to, and as, as well for me, to to put what guidance they give us into practice before we start asking for more guidance. Yeah. You know, because we don't want to get into that sort of dependent state where we just go into these states where we're just immediately asking for guidance and we yeah. haven't necessarily put into practice things that we've been told before. Yeah. But we're kind of asking for more for more for more guidance. So we need to we need to feel confident. And that's one of the pieces of guidance that I've been given quite a lot over the years, which is Tom, you don't need to ask for so much guidance. <laughs> you don't need to ask so much guidance if only you put into practice the things you already know um oh. that you know that that would be what you know what you need to, what you need to do so i have to i put out a thing for other questions no one's put anything yet so this might be a good one of the uh, things time I wanted, one on. thing i wanted to mention tom sorry to interrupt you but one thing i wanted to mention is that what people don't realize i'd say the vast majority of people don't realize they they you think of you as you and really you're so much more than you what we experience consciously at a conscious level is like a tiny fragment of our total awareness we've got this whole higher self going on and it's it's vast and there's all kinds of different aspects of our consciousness and awareness that are going on and when we sleep we spend that time doing all kinds of work doing all kinds of non-physical work astral work whatever learning lessons, attending meetings, going to classes, um, and we're, we're hardly ever aware of it. And most of this stuff happens when we're unconscious, and it's because the vast majority of our awareness is not the fragment that you're familiar with right now. It's like when we have an out-of-body experience, it's more, like, um, it's more like a zookeeper letting one of his, you know, one of the, one of the hyenas out of the cage, right? Um, and it's more like, you know, well, do we want to let this hyena out to, you know, wander the streets for a little bit of fun or are we going to get on with our business? And I think a lot of it is our higher selves have a lot of business. They've got a lot of stuff going on. They've got mm. healings and helping and teaching and learning and it, it, it's vast. And yeah. this little fragment of awareness that you and I are, that we identify as ourselves is just a tiny, tiny fraction of that. And to... And it's, not, and it's almost like it's an annoyance that, okay, we'll let him out of his body again just to appease him, you know, kind of thing. But it's like, we got to get on with our work. There's a whole greater you that's out there that's getting on with the, with the work. And sometimes you'll re come back to, uh, you know, from a dream and you'll be, you'll have been dreaming, you'll have been unconscious, but you'll be vaguely aware that other things have happened. Like I, I was in a one time I woke up from a dream and I had, in this dream, I had been in a conference room full of astral projection teachers. And I, I clearly remember Anthony Peake was standing there in front of me and we were talking across the other side of a conference room table about plans we were making and that. And it's like, God, I wish I could have more awareness in this life, in this body, in this tiny fragment of ego of what's going on out there, right? Um, mm -hmm. I think the part of it is, is the challenge is to integrate who we are with who we really are. And um, I think OBEs can help us get there, at least connect the pieces and, and give us a greater understanding of who we are. Anyway, that's that's all I wanted to say about that. Absolutely, that's really that's really beautiful. And we did say we would do some practice, so maybe we should do that because it's um, um, already 22 minutes past. Um, so th this might sound a bit weird on a live webinar, but I'm gonna ask for a quick toilet break. <laughs> Just so I can quickly, but when we come, I'll be back in a minute. But could we do some? Could we do some um, some practice together? I'd really like to do something, some some experiential practice together, and maybe we could experiment getting some of you guys on the screen as well, because there isn't, you know, there's probably enough people to get 
uh, onto the onto the screen. Like someone's saying, toilet break, great, great, uh, great idea! Exclamation mark. So that's good. So uh, we'll have a quick break. We'll come back. We'll do some. We'll do some pranayama. We'll do some exercises. Maybe Bob and I. We can kind of you know one of us can lead something for a bit and then pass over to the other just to give us a flavour of some of the meditation techniques that we find particularly. Uh, potent for for the outer body state. So I'll just be back. Just give me one minute. I'll be back in just a sec. Um, so I'm back now. Um, so yeah, does that sound all right, Bob? If I lead some um, yeah breath work thing and meditations for a bit, and then and then you you could come in and just uh, guide everyone through. Does, would anyone like to come on onto the screen so we can see you guys? It might be nice just to. <clears throat> yeah, so do let us know if you'd like to come onto the screen because I could um, I could put some of you as a panelist and then we'd be able to see you on the webcam. I think I can even allow people to talk as well, so we could hear their voice. Anyway, I'll leave that to you guys. If you guys want that, then just let me know. I can do that. So we're going to go into some practice time now. So some one of you asked before about breath work. Definitely breath work is one of the very potent exercises that loads of astral projection teachers would encourage people to do. Uh, obviously, when, you, when, you, when, you, when you're doing breath work, um, the ancient word would be pranayana. Uh, that word literally means breath expansion. And so you're bringing more oxygen into the body. Uh, breath work is also really, really good um, for quietening down the mind, quietening down the mind. Uh, and you can incorporate other different things within your breath work. So I'm going to encourage you to count the breath, which is also an aid for focus and concentration. If you're counting the breath when you're doing the breath work, then it helps you to go into more of a state of absorption and concentration focus as you're, as we're doing that. So I'll offer um, three uh, quick uh, different forms of breath work. So the first one is just what the ancient word was bastrika, which means bellows breath, which is just a big, long yogic, uh, deep yogic breathing. So breathing, allowing your belly to expand out as you inhale and bring the air up into the lungs as well. And don't be afraid of making, in fact, you're really supposed to make some sound when you're doing this. So if we just go into a period of long, um, deep yogic breathing, we can close our eyes when we do this, just allowing the belly to expand. The efforts required on the inhalation here, we just allow ourselves to relax as we exhale. And we'll just count the breath in cycles of three. So inhaling in and out one, in and out two, in and out three. It's really simple, it doesn't need to be complicated, just counting cycles of three. So just carry on. The reason it's called bellows breath is it's mimicking the sound of like the bellows blowing on the fire, like stoking the fire. And I always say that when we do breath work, it's like going beyond, beyond our breath comfort zones. The more you put into it, the more you'll get out of it.
And don't lose, don't worry if you lose mindfulness of the breath or the count, just come back to the breath, come back to the count. You might feel, begin to feel some more energy sensations as you do this long, deep yogic breathing. That's a good thing. You're bringing more oxygen, more chi, more prana into your system. And then taking a deep inhalation, holding your breath after you inhale. And then exhale. We've got a bit of a sound disturbance here. Because I noticed Daniel's joined us. He was due to be on the panel with us, so that might be what's going on here. Yeah, maybe. Can you hear me, Tom? Yeah, I can hear you now, yeah. Okay, yeah, maybe that's the issue here. Hmm. Did it stop? I don't have any issues on my end here. It's all right now. I'm just a bit squeezed here. Hmm. Yeah, I don't hear any, any disturbances here on my end. That's all right. strange. Maybe, so, it's all, maybe it's all the prana in the air. <laughs> <laughs> so Daniel, Daniel's also a well-known teacher of astral projection. He's dreaming and he's written a really good book on this topic. So I've got it because he he's due to be on here with us. So um, that's great. So do forgive us for the sound, this bit of sound disturbance going on. Um, the second pranayama that I'm going to offer to you is called Kapalabhati. Uh, which literally means shining skull breath, which might sound a bit of a weird name, but it's basically the reverse of what we were just doing. When you exhale, physically draw, physically draw in your navel. So you see my box across here. Physically draw in your navel center when you exhale. So the easiest way to do this is first through the mouth. Imagine you're like blowing out a candle. So you physically draw in the navel point when you exhale. And on the, on the, you just when you just allow the navel center to enter just to relax, it physically comes out, and then you'll just naturally draw in breath. So the only efforts required here on the exhalation. And when you get a hang of this, you can begin to do it through the nose. So again, just closing the eyes, a really good place to hold your attention is just what's the, called the trigger point for the third eye, just a bit above and between the eyebrows. So that's a classic point for the third eye, for the awakening of the balancing of the mind and it's connected to dreams, the imagination. And then again, taking a deep inhalation and then exhale. And this time, hold the breath after the exhalation. And then let go. And then really quick, kind of quite quickly, I'll offer another one called alternate nasal breathing. So a way to do this is taking your, your first, your index finger, second finger, placing it against the trigger point of the third eye, closing your right nostril first, breathing in through the left, closing your left nostril and breathing out through the right. Closing the right nostril, breathing in through the left, closing the left and out through the right. And then you just would just do this on one side. And then after a while, reverse it. So breathing in through the right, closing the right nostril and out through the left. Maybe I'll just leave it there. That's the way to do alternate nasal breathing. That's an ancient uh, yogic breathing technique. Um, the old word is Nadi Shuddhi, cleansing the energy channels within the system. 
it's good to, to bring a sort of sense of balance between the hemispheres of the brain as well. Um, so that's one technique to offer you guys in terms of breath work. So you've got the Bastrikar, long, deep yogic breathing, then the Kapalabhati, uh, bringing in the navel point when you exhale, relaxing on the inhalation, and the alternate nasal breathing. Um, and one technique as well that I've been playing around with a lot recently is a really good technique to stop the mind. And people say, how do I stop the mind? It's really, you know, it's, it's difficult to stop your thinking mind. And the, the, uh, the space of meditation, in a way, happens in the space between thoughts. And one way to get into the space between thoughts is take a really simple sentence. And for everyone that's developing astral projection, you could take a sentence like, I am more than my physical body and pause between the words. So if you say something like, um, I am more than my physical body. And you might have noticed that your mind is suspending in the space between the words because it knows what's coming next. And you can take affirmations or sentences like that. Allow your mind to pause between the words. It's a really good way just to feel that state of non-thought. It's a really simple exercise. And okay, so that's a couple of techniques for me, the breath work and the, uh, the stopping the mind. The last, last technique that I'll just offer before bringing in uh, the other two is... Um, a lot of astral projection techniques involve movement in some way, the use of the imagination. And if you're working with the energy centers, what we call the chakras, traditionally the chakras are said to spin. And if, when you become really familiar with this, you'll be able to do this energetically. But if you say, to, if you say, you know, if you just say to someone, begin to, you know, spin your, move your, your, your energy body or begin to spin around the, the chakra areas, you might find that difficult. But the way that you can get into a feeling for doing that um, is if you physically begin to rotate. You physically begin to ro rotate from meditation. You're rotating the body and bring your attention down into the areas. So there are seven major chakras. I'm sure most of you will be familiar with them, but if not, you can look them up later. Hold your attention in the, in the chakras. And say if you begin with the first chakra, there are some traditions that would say that moves clockwise. So you can begin to move clockwise. And then after a while of doing this, just stay stationary. But because you've had this physical movement, it's easier to feel the, that, just that continuous spiraling movement. And then that helps you to get into those kind of energy exercises, what I call kind of dynamic energy exercises, or Robert Bruce would talk about it in terms of tactile imaging or using your tactile imagination. You'll begin and you can begin to make the spirals bigger. You can take your awareness out just a bit beyond your physical body. And then this help will help to sort of to, to spark off that magic where you begin to, to awaken your deeper energy body. And you'll begin to get into those states where you'll, you'll find it easier for the emergence of what we call the, the vibrations. So again, if you're working through the chakras, the second chakra, physically beginning to rotate the other way, anti-clockwise, and then stop, and then you, and then, but then continue it, but with your imagination, and you can do that all the way up through the chakras. It's a really good technique that I've been experimenting with recently but i'll bring in the other guys and maybe bring in daniel first because he's just joined us do you have any techniques you'd like to offer to everyone daniel in terms of uh, meditations or energy exercises for out of body experiences sure first of all i love the way that you're presenting it actually it's it's one of the biggest hang-ups people get caught on when when what you're offering is 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 very simple which doesn't mean easy but it's simple is the cultural lingo people get hung up on for example People use chakras and they have their own idea of what that means. Particularly here in the West, we have so many different conflicting ideas of what these things mean because we're so addicted to information and books and so on and so forth. And we have very little direct experience of these things on a day-to-day -day basis. So what I would tell my students is, like you started off with the breath, very important because breathing is energy. And it's not energy. I mean, that's such an abstract word. 
it's it's about to open up the channels within you so that you can have a new experience of feeling. It's a movement that happens and exists that isn't like the physical movement, but at the same time isn't divorced entirely from your experience of physical movement, that you cannot access unless you open those centers up. And you won't know what those centers are. Those are just words until you experience them. So as Tom pointed out so eloquently, you need a method to do that. One of the most direct methods is diet and breathing. And the moment you start to breathe, you can even try it. I mean, you've experienced situations in your own life where let's say you're, you're full of panic or you're cold and you can't ventilate. Your whole body will start to tingle and you'll become very conscious of, of different areas of your body if you pay attention that you weren't aware of before because you were too up here or you were too off in whatever activity you were doing. You can build up a new level of energy and then find a balance. It's not about more. It's about increasing and finding a new balance there. Your channels open up and then you can start moving like Tom was pointing out this subtle movement. I can't specify how important that step is. Once you've gained enough energy to open up the channels, that opens the door and solidifies them as experiences that now your subconscious and your conscious mind can work in tandem because they both have an idea now of what it is you're trying to do. So what I like to do is I'll close with this. If you can't figure out a way to make physical movement more subtle by doing something like spiraling, slowly stopping until the spiraling happens inside, mm. particularly falling asleep, then find an activity such as swinging even. Even if you have kids and you go to the playground and you're on a swing and you just start swinging, really pay attention to the sensations, the visceral sensations associated with being on a swing set. Then go home and you're falling asleep, do the breathing, and then recreate those sensations of swinging as you fall asleep. Think about something as simple as swinging. That is in line with my cosmic order. So if you ask in Dallas, which is more where I, I hail from, that movement, that swinging movement, if you look at a long master, it looks like a physical exercise, and you think, okay, he's loosening up his spine. Yes and no. The deep the waving and the swinging happens inside. That's a fire path. Okay? You'll find that you do these things as you fall asleep. If you're going this way and you recreate that swinging sensation, all of a sudden you break the loose of your physical form. And this waving happens outside you. This point you may have an out-of-body experience or just a lucid dream. And they are similar but not the same thing. I get a lot of people mad when I say that. Start with that. Breathing and then movement, physical, and then slowly make it more internal, and then you've got it. That's Very wonderful. Good. That's wonderful. That's really the key. Sorry, Bob, do you want to come in? No, I, I just to... wanted to say I agree completely with what both of you said. I agree there's that, that sense of movement is very important, at least to me in my pra uh, practice. And I tend to not be as much oriented toward um, spinning as you are, although I do do- I'm such a spinner. I'm like, I'm like Mr. Spinner. I do, I do energy exercises where, and, and I learned this in Tai Chi class, you know, a lot of years ago. <coughs> you know, I, I, I stand uh, and I, I just have my hands out like this and I feel the energy between the hands and then I circulate the energy around my body like this from arm to arm in a big circular motion. I mean, and then I also feel the energy ball between my hands as well, and I do I do this as well. But even more common is what what um, Daniel's talking about, and that is this waving sensation, the sensation of rocking back and forth. And I, I talk about that uh, in a, several of the exercises in my <coughs> book. But yeah, that that whole sense of motion of of swinging forward and backward, imagining that you're on the bow of a ship going up and down, imagining you're in a swing set, like Daniel said. I mean, all of those things are very very good exercises to do in preparation for this. You can get that momentum. What happens is if you're lying there and you're asleep, or you're trying to get your body to sleep, but you got this sense of motion. What ends up, <coughs> at least for me. Is um, increases and increases steadily until you have enough momentum to just propel yourself completely out of the body. The momentum just keeps building on itself and building on itself. So yeah, uh, both very good suggestions, good exercises. There I, is I something magical about spinning for some reason, at least I find that I haven't lost my voice. Sometimes when I come out of my body, 
if I don't feel I have enough energy to keep, the, to keep it moving or if I'm a bit stuck, I'll come back to my body, begin spinning. And sometimes it's, it's not slow spinning. Like we're talking about seriously fast spinning to build up the energy and then to release it then. Or often when I'm in out of body experiences or lucid dreams and I, and I, and I ask to a connect to a very transcendent energy, maybe I want to connect to some enlightened being. Sometimes my energy body will just begin to spin rapidly in order to sort of come to this higher state of vibration in some way. Yep, and, <clears throat> and uh, Robert Monroe talked about spinning techniques. Um, the whirling dervishes talk, uh, they use physical spinning um, to accomplish similar things. And what that does is that jars loose your sense of equilibrium and your, um, uh, your, your temporal parietal junction sense of where you are and what you're doing. It, it's, it basically um, messes with your um, story of experience. And so, yeah, that's, that's very, uh, spinning is definitely a good thing as well. Do you, do you have any techniques, Bob, that you're currently just within your own practice or experimenting with at the moment? Well, you know, I'm, I'm constantly changing it up and trying different things. And uh, recently I've been reading a book by uh, the VM Beelzebub's book called uh, Eight Week Course or whatever, Experiential Course. Um, by Beelzebub, that sounds a bit dangerous. Oh, well, yeah. It, it's, a, it's a pseudonym. It sounds very... <laughs> Pseudonym, but uh, and I'll and look for a book review on it in a, in a few <laughs> weeks, several weeks on my blog. Um, but anyway, one of the things that he is recommending is um, using mantras. And so I've been um, experimenting with mantras more often in conjunction with breathing. And so one of the things, for example, uh, that he recommends is he recommends um, several mantras like uh, la, like la, ra. So L A W A or La L A R A and then S S S. So and he does it uh, inhale La inhale you know exhale so that you're doing the, the you're imagining La or even saying it on the exhale you're inhaling and then saying the Ra and then you're inhaling and then you're saying so just a, an S like you're you're I don't know like you're sizzling so. Uh, Breathing, la, breathing, ra, breathing, s. And so I've been experimenting with things like that. But, you know, I'm always experimenting all the time. Sounds and quite infernal, quite sort of devilish almost. <laughs> well, he's, he's <laughs> the, got the, a... These sounds, ra is, is the old, is the, is the sun god, isn't it? And that sense yeah, and, of fire. He's got a few others that uh, in the book that are also um, uh, kind of Egyptian oriented as well, but I think he comes from a more esoteric tradition or, he, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, or the information does anyway, that he's passing along. Um, but anyway, I'm, I'm enjoying the book. I'm enjoying, I, I'm constantly always reading OBE books and trying different things, but that's one of the things I was trying last night. Um, but anyway, uh, just, I think that the, the most important is, is using your imagination to do the energy bouncing and, and trying to give your, um, trying to feed yourself an alternate story of experience so you can jar yourself out of that um, normal streamline of what your physical senses are telling you. Mm -hmm. So Daniel's come back in now. Yeah, it's your... I'm you guys. <laughs> what I miss? <laughs> Nothing important. More spinning? You, you, you missed a very uh, potent uh, mantra technique. Involving the sounds la ra sa la ra sa to build up some sort of psychic energy within within, within ourselves, the fire element within ourselves. The Bob was just talking about the, a book that he's been reading recently. Uh, so it'd be great to hear a bit more from you, uh, uh, Daniel. Actually, because um, we've only at this, we'll see how people are for time. But at the moment, we've, we've only got about ten minutes left left sure. of our scheduled scheduled time. Do you want to just sort of introduce yourself a bit, Daniel, to the group and then just, you know, say about how, how what your experience at the moment is of Astro Project, how you relate to it, how you got into it, why is it, why did you decide to make it a part of your journey? Sure, sure. Well, well, for me, my journey began when I was about nine years of age. It was actually quite a terrifying initiation for me. Uh, I grew up in a very Christian household, as many people in the West did. My father was a pastor and my mother's side was equally pious. 
And so every single interpretation of my out-of-body experiences and my lucid dreams were pretty much sold to me as a tug of war between God and the devil with my soul. So after a while, it was terrible, particularly the exit symptoms and, you know, the, the sensations uh, uh, incumbent upon an approaching OBE uh, were terrifying for me. I thought that I was dying. I thought that I was being thrown into some outer region of hell or whatever the case may be, because I felt, you know, all the typical symptoms of suffocation, being crushed and being disoriented by proprioception, being all this disentangled. And so after a while, my social life, my school life, everything began to suffer. And I went to everybody from, I mean, I was dragged to hospitals, to psychiatrists, to even pastors and priests, and all in an attempt to, to figure out what was going on with me. It wasn't until I was about 14, 15 years of age and I was made a ward of the state and I was in foster care that I began to really be able to explore different modalities from the East and, and also from the West and other traditions. Uh, I found my home eventually in the integral movement and in Taoist philosophy, but that's just my, my personal key. Like Tom was talking about how spinning works for him in a methodological sense. Everybody's got their magic bullet. For some people, it can be something as simple as they're sleeping on a waterbed. Uh, and for like the first time in their life and like one, one day or a week later, the sensation of rocking follows them into the sleep cycle. And next thing you know, they're having the most mind blowing experience of their life. For me, it happened spontaneously, I think as a result of asthma medication I was given. As a child, I couldn't breathe and I was often rushed to the hospital because I literally couldn't draw breath. I would wake up in the middle of the night, unable to draw any breath and almost die on the way to the ER frequently. So I was prescribed steroids to open my lungs up. That's when a lot of my disturbances started to happen. Why they were covered in such a negative way, I don't know, but it took, I'm gonna say, when I was about 14 is when the door slammed shut because of fear. As you both know, fear is probably one of the biggest enemies and barriers to successful OBE. Uh, it just, it creates what I call the psychic moat. There's just this gap between the experience and, and, and your almost desire to understand it and make it happen again and your absolute terror of it ever happening again. Uh, and it took, it took about roughly five years for me to, of really exploring different modalities to open that door again and make sure I could face it. And it was very scary for me, but I just let it happen. And ever since then, the door just never shut. So I started going down the road, like, like, like Bob, with Taiji Chuan, Qigong, various forms of meditation, like embryonic meditation and microcosmic orbit. And I really dove into Yi Jin Jing and things like that, sexual abstinence, going on a completely organic diet. And I followed that for roughly eight years before I started seeing various things form, connections between these systems form. And it was like Eureka. All of these things are saying much the same thing, which of course shouldn't come as a surprise, but it did to me because I was practicing these things for very specific, discrete reasons. And they all converge really on conscious sleep. It's really making the unconscious conscious and making your conscious capable of diving into the unconscious and exploring that realm. So years later, I created S SCT, Subliminal Cognition Training, which brings all the best it's an integral system of bringing all of the best modalities that have stood the test of time on the table. And so people can not necessarily cherry pick, but find what calls to them at first, put together a comprehensive map and start working on these things. And they can see the language that these systems share and speak, even if they tend to be at war with each other culturally. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. And I really, I'd, I'd recommend Daniel's book as well. What's it called again? The, the Complete Guide oh, uh, to Conscious first Sleep? The book is called Behind the Veil, The Complete Behind Guide. Behind the Veil, The Complete Guide to Conscious Sleep. And it really is. I think uh, Daniel does seem to have one of these great gifts to be able to integrate so much knowledge from different systems. And we all have that to some extent, but be able to offer that in a very open and spacious way. I think it's wonderful to Thank you. have someone that's able to teach in that way. And it isn't one of the, you know, it's easy for us to become partisan and think, you know, that Very. They, that only yeah. this system has the answer and everything else is nonsense. But as, as I was saying, a lot of, there is a common, there is a lot of common ground between these different practices. Mm -hmm. And one of the common areas of practice that's interesting for me, because I practice Kundalini Yoga, is that at the beginning of this um, webinar, Bob was talking about experiences that do seem to arise within people's practices when they're, when they're raising this energy of Kundalini, when you feel in those areas between sleep and wake that you've been struck by 
struck by lightning or you get those classic ones where you feel like there's a buzzing bee inside your head or something and you can have all sorts of things going on that seem to lead to these and these developments of your energy body to the point that uh that you know that you do get into these states of outer body state or, or the vibrations and one thing for me because i'm not i'm not naturally uh, scientifically minded i'm more kind of within the sort of just esoteric symbolism and the kind of the the ancient way of seeing these things. So I'd be interested, Bob, is there any, you know, do you have any, any sense from science or neuroscience when you're talking about these experiences of feeling like you've been struck by lightning or the classic ones of the buzzing bee inside the head, or is there any kind of current thinking in neuroscience or science around what might be happening biologically within the body? Um, I'm not sure that science has studied the phenomenon enough to know that. Um, there are some um, conjecture, but, but it's all just conjecture at this point, right? We really don't know what's happening. It really needs more scientific study. Um, mm -hmm. Another very common one is where people will suddenly hear a very loud banging sound. Um, one theory that people have is that um, it, it may have something to do with epileptic seizures. I mean, there, there's, um, uh, I know some of the, um, some of the things with epileptic seizures is that, um, it's a bouncing of, of neural um, feedback that goes back and forth between the two hemispheres of the brain. And um, so there is a belief that maybe an OBE is in the brain uh, manifests as a mild form of a seizure or something like that. And maybe these vibrations are just our brain's interpretation of this feedback that's going on, although it's not nearly, you know, no body convulsing or anything like that. Um, another interesting theory is that um, if you look at my family, for example, my grandmother had terrible migraine headaches all her life. Uh, my mother had terrible migraine headaches all my life. My sister has terrible migraine headaches. Uh, and at least two of my brothers have terrible migraine headaches. Um, uh, my brother, Tom, I would, I would have to take him to the hospital. They were so bad. I mean, he was, he was so bad with the migraine that he would throw up. Um, I've never had any migraines at all. So that, that's a very curious thing is like, is my, are my OBEs, do I have OBEs because I don't have the inherited migraines or is the, my, my, um, is it that I manifest OBEs instead of migraines where my, all of my siblings have migraines? I don't know. There's no link to that. Um, there's a lot of theories out there, but it definitely needs more scientific scrutiny and, and testing. Rick's just saying that I've been suffering from migraines since I was 15. I've actually had them cause an exit. So he feels that that directs. Can I, I've, I've noticed as well that a lot of these experiences seem to happen at the point that those, what's the word, hypnic shock experiences might often happen. You know, and scientists would say that was what would help our genetic ancestors, you know, the monkeys in the trees from falling out of the trees and those points between sleep and wake. A lot of these energy experiences seem to happen at those points when those hypnic shock experiences might have usually normally happened, which are more mild, but maybe because of all of this energy work, this work we've been doing, they're much more kind of, uh, a lot more seems to happen within these, within these experiences. Yeah, it's true though, like epileptics and people who suffer from migraines, they have what's called an aura that usually precedes their attack. And if something like that is prone to happen, let's say between the hours of 3 and 5 a.m., when you're really towards the hypnopompic area of your sleep cycle, then yeah, your brain can get these things confused of what's going on here. And because your body is pretty much essentially, you know, completely numb, it has more of a subjective experience where I, I want to say the ethic of the astral body can break free. The neurological component of that could be what I call ethric dissonance. It's where that bioelectricity, those waves overlap temporarily and cause like the biochemical equivalent of feedback on a guitar amp or something. You know, when these two waves are too close to each other, it form, forms a sort of, yeah, energetic seizure, which may actually be biological as well to some degree. Well, and then there's also this to consider. I know that some people use, um, like, like there's the, the, some lucid dream type machines. Um, I forget what, what they're called, but there, there are some lucid dream machines that actually flash lights. And of course, flashing lights, you know, with your clothes, with your eyes closed, you have the flashing lights or whatever, trying to induce various altered states. And of course, people who are prone to epilepsy, um, that can sometimes, flashing lights can trigger that response. Yeah. 
And so, yeah, there, there might be a connection there. It's all, it's all very interesting. From a they physical. tested me for that at 14 when I was hospitalized. They kept me awake all night, gave me coffee, anything to keep me awake. And then in the morning, they gave me testing. They poked me up to an EEG. I mean, fall asleep. They strobe various frequencies of light into my eyes. Yeah. Discovered I wasn't epileptic. I didn't have anything like that happening. So, yeah, it's definitely a good thing to check for right away because it could be one way of, of I guess, more uncomfortable way of entering this topic and that skill. Okay, I'm just conscious of the time. It's 6 p.m. now. I think we've had a really like great session. There's obviously so much to uh, so much to talk about and so much more that we could talk about during these sessions. I think it's really uh, not to float our own boat, but really kind of really, you know, you guys are fortunate to have us up <laughs> on the screen here talking about this stuff. Uh, but it's been really good to have all of you, the questions from you guys as well. And, uh, you know, hopefully we've been able to answer them. And I'll talk to Daniel and Bob about potential to do future stuff as well. And I'll, I'll you know, keep in contact with everyone that's joined us today and also the people that, that were registered to join but maybe haven't been able to, to come along today. And uh, maybe just as a final thing, do you guys want to share any links to work that you're doing at the moment or things for people to follow up? Any current projects or books you want to mention to people? Go ahead, Bob. I, I guess you go first. <laughs> Well, um, my website is robertpeterson.org. There's all kinds of good free information on there, links to my blog, links to all kinds of articles that I've written and uh, pictures of my book and, and stuff. I've got five books out there. My latest is Hacking the Out-of-Body Experience. Um, it's uh, gotten very good five-star reviews on Amazon. So uh, if you're interested, and I think uh, I want to thank Tom Llewellyn um, for setting this all up and coordinating it, and Daniel Kelly also. Um, fabulous to share the, this, this stage, this uh, virtual venue um, with you guys, and I uh, hope to do it again. Thanks. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, this has been really good fun. So my website's called uh, www.soulremember.com. Uh, I've got online courses on Kundalini Yoga, Lucid Dreaming, Astral Projection. They're all on Udemy at the moment. The, one on Astro, the latest one, Astral Projection, is called Astral Projection, An Ultimate Guide. I've got books, one, The Initiation, progressive spiritual manual that covers or it goes into astral projection that's available on amazon but you'll find out about all of that through my website i can offer coaching as well for people one-to-one -one if that's something you want to explore mm -hmm. uh, so yeah thanks everyone for joining us it's been a re real pleasure and i really enjoyed um talking to daniel and bob and, and learned a lot and just really yeah. nice to share this because it is alina it's a bit of a niche thing it's not that you can just easily talk to this stuff about everyone so just kind of it's nice to have the shared space, shared mind, but also it's really good as well just to have that, some practice together to bring this together. Because a lot of people practice astral projection in their, you know, in their, in their personal lives. It can be just like a solo thing other than the beings that you meet in the astral plane or sometimes people go onto Facebook and, you know, but it can be a bit kind of, you know, it's good, but it can be a bit kind of, kind of uh, remote from having this kind of live live interaction. So I think it works really well. I'll, I'll talk to the guys about potential. So, so well said, Tom, about. so well said. It's, it's so important to have a community of like-minded people. And I think a lot of people who are attracted to these topics tend to be a bit reclusive or at least introverted at the very least. And uh, Okay, uh, Len is just going to come and say hello. My lovely, my lovely partner Len is just going to say hello. <laughs> this is hello Lena. Hi, this Lena. Is Bob. Lovely this is Daniel. Daniel. We've nice had a great time. Lena saying hello. So are, right, are so, you an projector as well? Eh? Is, is you Lena an astral projector as well? <laughs> <laughs> okay, that, she does sometimes that. join me. She does sometimes, uh, you know, she does sometimes come, come and we have encounters when I'm in these states. But um, Oh, that's great. <laughs> maybe, maybe at some top point it will open up for Lena as well. Okay, thanks for everyone. Hope you have a wonderful rest of the uh, rest me. of your weekend. All right, thank Take you. Care. Thanks, Bye. guys. Talk to you again.